The single most important prayer to the ancient Israelites is known as the Shema, and it continues to be so today. It begins in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. This verse is used more than any other in the Bible to affirm the fact that God is one. In fact, the Shema was so influential and important that Jesus cited it when he addressed the scribes in Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 30. The scribes asked him what was the greatest commandment. The passage reads, Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Even today, as Christians, we can look to the words of the Shema as a wonderful expression that He is the one true God. However, the first sentence in the Shema is often used by modern rabbis and critics of Christianity to deny the Christian belief that God is triune in nature, meaning that the one true God consists of three separate persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, all of them being equal and one in nature and all sharing the same will. So why would Jesus point his critics to the Shema as the greatest commandment if its first sentence, which reads, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, appears to contradict his claim as being God in the flesh, sharing the same essence and power of God the Father. That's because the Shema doesn't contradict the Holy Trinity, but rather explicitly reveals it, which I'll show in a minute. But first, it's important to note that many don't realize that the view of God being complex in nature is in fact in line with the interpretation of the ancient Israelites prior to Jesus' arrival. Even the concept of the Holy Spirit shows up as early as Genesis, in the first chapter when God's Spirit is hovering over the waters below. Ancient rabbis prior to the arrival of Jesus repeatedly contended with the idea of God being at least two powers. Rabbinical scholar Alan Siegel produced perhaps the single leading work on the idea of two powers in heaven in Jewish thought. According to a piece written by renowned Old Testament theologian and author Michael Heiser, Siegel demonstrated that the two powers idea was not deemed heretical in Jewish theology until the 2nd century AD. He carefully traced the roots of the teaching back into the Second Temple period, also known as the Intertestamental period, around 200 BCE. Siegel was able to establish that the idea was rooted in Old Testament scriptures. Several passages, in fact, became subjects of the rabbinic discussion. For example, in Genesis chapter 19.24 it says, Then the Lord reigned on Sodom and Gomorrah, sulfur and fire, from the Lord out of heaven. Heiser goes on to say regarding this verse, If you notice that the divine name Yahweh, translated Lord, cursed twice, creating the impression of two divine actors, you saw what many Jewish thinkers saw in ancient times. And this isn't the only passage in which this occurs. The Old Testament contains many other similar passages in which the Lord is speaking and then refers to God in the third person. Another example is in Amos chapter 4 verse 11, where God is speaking and he says, I overthrew some of you as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were as a brand plucked out of the burning, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. This passage and many others throughout the Old Testament refer to God as Elohim in the original Hebrew, which is the plural form of the Hebrew word for God, or Eloah. Yet, when referring to God, it is always followed by a singular verb, indicating God is one, but has a complex nature. This doesn't prove the Trinity, but it certainly led to the ancient Israelites' understanding of God as being much more complex than they could fathom. In the Hebrew Scriptures, God also often referred to himself in the plural, like in Genesis chapter 3, verse 22, it says, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us. So when we look even closer at the Shema, we find more proof that God is complex in nature. Let's read it again. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The original Hebrew for the word one in this passage is akkad, which is defined not as an absolute one, but a compound one. For example, in Genesis 1, chapter 5, the combination of evening and morning comprise one, akkad, day. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, a man and a woman come together in marriage, and the two shall become one, akkad, one flesh. Also, in Ezra chapter 2, verse 64, we are told that the whole assembly was as one, akkad, yet it included many people. In providing us with the Shema, if God wanted to ensure that the reader would understand his nature as absolute, indivisible oneness, he could have led Moses to use the word yakid, which is found in many scripture passages. It also meant one, but emphasized the oneness as being only or indivisible. In fact, Maimonides, who was a medieval Sephardic Jewish philosopher, who became one of the most prolific and influential Torah scholars of the Middle Ages, noted the strength of yakid 
and chose to substitute that word in his 13 articles of faith in place of the word akkad when describing the oneness of God. However, Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4, the Shema, does not use Yaqid in reference to God. Another interesting point is that the verse refers to God three times, twice as Adonai and once as Eloheinu, which means our God, perhaps further hinting at the Trinity. Many theologians believe passages like the Shema demonstrate a preview of the Trinity by repeating God's name in threes. Another example of this is in Numbers chapter 6 verses 24 through 26. It reads, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. In fact, I believe whether Moses knew it or not, God intended his name to be written three times because he was revealing his triune nature. Notice at the beginning the word Shema means to hear or pay close attention, or more specifically to carefully meditate on what is about to be said, and not only listen but obey. The use of Shema meant that the following words were of utmost importance, and we see that they are because they all referred to God's nature. Moses could have easily used God's name once to convey that God is one, and it would have been clear. But he didn't. He used it three times for a reason, to convey the completeness of God. Experts agree that the use of threes in Scripture are known to convey completeness, which I believe is ultimately pointing us to God and His triune nature. You know, we are told that every jot and tittle in the Bible has been appointed by God, not one idly mentioned. It's something to think about when you're reading the text and you look upon every word placed there by the divine providence of God. People are so quick to deny the Trinity or God's triune nature because it is a mystery to them. They say it doesn't make sense, it's not logical. Yet they say this in blissful ignorance about many other mysteries they can't explain, each living life accepting everything as it is unless, of course, it has something to do with God. Rabbi Lauren Jacobs is the senior rabbi and founder of Congregation Shema Israel. He writes, There are many people who reject what they can't explain. These people forget that their whole life is surrounded by mysteries they do not understand. They fail to consider that any real explanation of even the simplest phenomenon in nature lies in hidden obscurity beyond their comprehension. Since we can't understand the mystery of a caterpillar spinning a cocoon and emerging as a spectacular butterfly, how a spider knows to spin a complex, strong, and beautiful web, how a salmon returns to the exact spot in the river where it was born three years earlier, why should we expect to fathom the greatest mystery of all, the eternal, all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-wise three-in-one God? Even as I try to explain God's triunity, I can't fully grasp it myself, nor can anyone else. It's impossible for us as God's creatures in our current state to understand Him fully. The minute we think we grasp the fullness of God is when we must step back and ask whether we've made our own image of God. Thank you and God bless.